welcome back to my channel at Mayora. It's Sarah here and today I'm going to talk about American literature and specifically about an author that I absolutely love so much. She is one of my favorite poets. I'm talking about Emily Dickinson. Uh, you have requested this video and I am really really excited because uh, I love the idea of talking about her. This is why this won't be the, 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 the only video about her. There will be at least another, okay? At least another. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, her life but uh, specifically more uh, about uh, her poetry, her perceptions, her, her perspectives um, of life, of, of art, of poetry. Um, well, we will try and interpret uh, uh, some of it uh, through her own words. She wrote a lot, she wrote a lot of amazing poems and she also wrote a lot of letters and so we can actually, she gave us the chance to um, interpret uh, what she, she did, to interpret her, her, her work through her own words and eyes. So we'll try to do that and in my next video I will pick, uh, I'm going to pick five, uh, uh, five poems. It will be very very difficult because there are so so many and so amazing so it will be very hard to pick five of them but we will read them together and talk about them together then if there are more you want me to talk about please let me know okay I can talk about Emily Dickinson like forever. Now, um, Emily Elizabeth Dickinson. She was born in Massachusetts, okay, in uh, Amherst, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts in uh, 1830 and she died there in uh, 1886. And uh, well, she is such a powerful and an enigmatic and, and uh, um, unconventional poet. Her works are today are very well known. We find uh, her poems uh, on the internet, on social medias, media, ev everywhere. But most of the times they tend to be interpreted uh, in a very superficial way. Um, and that, 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 that's, that's wrong because uh, behind these this, this poems there is a, a whole world, a world of depth that uh, can actually um, somehow um, describe very tiny or, 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 or um, simple elements and make them universal. And this is why uh, Emily's poetry will never die, okay? It will always be a mirror of ourselves forever, okay? It's universal and powerful. Now, um, as I said before, she was, she was born in uh, 1830 uh, and uh, her father was a lawyer, a wealthy man, it was a wealthy family actually, belonging to the upper middle class. Uh, she received a very good education, a free education, she attended the Amherst Academy and then she had the chance to uh, attend a female seminary, the name was Mount Holyoke. And uh, um, she was described, uh, when she was at school, she was described as a shy young woman but funny somehow and uh, she, was, uh, she wasn't beautiful but she was pretty and charming, always well dressed. It's very hard uh, to understand why at the age of 23 she decided to change her life completely. In a letter she wrote, she, um, or better, she expresses her desire not to leave home anymore. And, and so she did. She uh, chose a life of, um, well, somehow of self-isolation, of loneliness, a very, very isolated life. Um, probably uh, this decision didn't depend on her family, almost certainly didn't depend on her family. The most important figure 
uh, was her father at home and um, she loved him genuinely. He was a very strict Calvinist and she described him in her letters as a strict uh, pedantic man but also very loving and caring and uh, they had very good relationships and she loved him uh, she considered him uh, she, 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 she said she said that he was as as um, as hard as uh, as iron but at the same time as clear as water so she had a very positive uh, um, opinion of her father and she did love him when he died actually it's very, uh, it's very weird. She um, never went to visit his grave. This can uh, uh, make us think about the fact that something deep was apparently very difficult to uh, elaborate. Okay, for her, obviously. Um, when uh, Mrs. Holland uh, sent her a letter containing a clover. Uh, that she had plucked okay, from uh, Emily's father's grave, um, Emily answered, okay, replied, and uh, in, uh, in her letter, okay, writing back to Mrs. Holland, she wrote these words exactly. When I think of his firm light, obviously she's talking about the father who is passed, when I think of his firm light, quenched so causelessly, it fritters the worth of much that shines, dust unto the, unto the dust, indeed. But the final close of that marvelous sentence was rendered it. Now, um, we can perceive her suffering here, how much she misses her father, and uh, um, how um, well disoriented she is, she can't find answers um, and, and uh, there is um, a kind of a, I can say denial, but uh, a certainly um, sort of um, reluctancy in, uh, in, in trying to uh, giving um, a reason to death or an explanation, so there is a, um, a strong difficulty in trying to metabolize that from a personal point of view and religious point of view as well. And then she goes on and, and says, thank you for the affection, obviously she's, she's talking to Mrs. Holland, it helps me up the stairs at night, where as I pass my father's door, I used to think was safety, the end that plucked the clover. I seek, and I am, Emily. Now, um, obviously, it is um, quite moving. Okay, she she talks um, here. Uh, I mean, she's like a little girl here who um, feels. Uh, the, the need okay to to find safety next to the father's room or the father who has passed so it's difficult for her to climb the stairs at night so it's absolutely touching and very human okay and um, she feels like the hand like the hand that uh, plucked that that clover by the way the the clover itself is a symbol that she uses a uh, again and again in her poetry as many other very simple sim symbols um, of nature like uh, birds or flowers or bees um, and all these tiny elements um, actually achieve a much greater uh, meaning and they become universal and so this is quite interesting how this small uh, clever this small thing can, can mean so much, so much to her. Now, um, as the critics have finally understood throughout the, 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 the years, the centuries actually, um, it was kind of a mistake to totally identify um, Emily's poetry and her life. Uh, or personality somehow. Because uh, everything in her poetry is um, supported, created, reinvented by imagination. 
uh, fantasy is is uh, uh, maybe um, well we can say it's it's the most important tool and instrument she uses and uh, this is why she is so enigmatic after all it's not that easy to understand even if the poems look extremely easy uh, well they tend to hide um, a much more complex meaning um, and uh, well of course uh, the, her urge to be very discreet and that, that, that also of course it was related to her lifestyle but uh, this, this urge was also quite um, obvious in her works uh, so the desire to be discreet make it uh, more uh, difficult to to see the true depth uh, okay behind verses uh, that could appear easy somehow or even naive um, truth is that uh, in our poetry we can find a strong combination of, of reason, emotion, even sensuality. And the interior life uh, that was moved by imagination and fantasy was obviously um, also driven by or influenced by friendships and real relationships. Like for example the, the friendship she had with uh, Leonard Humphrey, the director of um, uh, Amherst Academy, or with uh, Benjamin Newton who studied law exactly as her father did or oh, more important Charles uh, Charles Wadworth uh, Charles Wadworth was the pastor of the second Presbyterian church and uh, he uh, and Emily had uh, apparently a secret affair um, when they met in 1854 uh, he was uh, uh, 41 he was married with children so of course it was a secret love and um, it is possible more than possible actually that uh, uh, her poems at the times at the time sorry uh, expressing love and affection uh, were actually directed to him she confesses her love in a, in a letter to Mrs. Holland and she uh, describes the world as a paradise, the world as paradise on, on, on earth, excepting for the cold ice uh, uh, that uh, arrives at win in winter, excepting for uh, the people who actually die, um, excepting for the roses who fade away, okay, with all these exceptions, uh, okay, the world should be or would be or could be uh, like paradise, paradise on earth uh, because of love. Unfortunately, um, this love fades away quite soon. Um, Wadworth actually visited her uh, once in uh, um, 1860 uh, and she even expressed uh, her idea, the possibility to move to San Francisco which was a very strong decision or thought anyway for her because of course she was so um, I mean home and her familiar household was so important to her but unfortunately, uh, the secret love uh, um, well, produced, uh, or anyway, um, was uh, um, the, um, caused her okay uh, disillusionment and and uh, and and pain and suffering and sorrow, and from this moment on, we have a, a period uh, when her poems talked about uh, fear and, 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 and loneliness uh, most of the times and her letters too when uh, she wrote to her uncle in uh, 1858 her uncle uncle Switzer she talked about this sharp pain she was suffering from and, and she, 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 she told exactly I read her words I cannot always see the light please tell me if it shines so obviously it's a moment of incredible sadness 
depression maybe i don't know we can't say that today it's it makes no sense to try and analyze or psychoanalyze uh, emily dickinson today but for sure that was a moment of, uh, of deep sorrow and uh, and um well uh, the, the the her fears and her uh, loneliness and her loneliness sorry were emphasized by this uh, this disillusionment we can say so then in uh, 1862 uh, the suffering the pain was apparently over most of it anyway and it was one of the most prolific years uh, in her life um, from 1878 to 1883, uh, uh, so this five years, um, she actually developed a new friendship, friendship with uh, uh, a judge, the ju judge Otis P. Lord, um, and she even considered marriage. It didn't happen. And uh, afterwards, she actually met the man who um, influenced her, her most, uh, the most, um, as a person, as a woman, and as a poet. Uh, he was her, she actually defined him as her literary preceptor. Uh, but he was also a friend, and he was Thomas Wentworth Higginson. He was a, a writer, a journalist, a literary critique. He wrote for the Atlantic Monthly, that was a quite popular cultural magazine at the time. And uh, he had been a Unitarian minister as well. Um, he, uh, he was extremely engaged in politics. In fact, he was a, uh, an abolitionist and uh, he had very strong feelings about that. Uh, he had been a soldier as well and uh, during the Civil War um, he served in the 1st uh, um, Black Regiment, we can say so. And, uh, and so he strongly believed and fought for the rights of freed people, okay, and, uh, and, and that was a very strong strong um, ideal for him um, it was a very strong personality at, at, at the time uh, and um, very busy in fact uh, she um, kind of um, well um, it, it is absolutely well known that she started one of her letters uh, with these words uh, um, uh, I'm going to read the words are you too deeply occupied to tell if my verse is alive <laughs> so she was <laughs> a little bit uh, okay mm, she, she, uh, basically she was asking for more attention because he didn't always answer reply okay or answer her letters but he did most of the time and um, and uh, uh, actually the relationship the friendship was very strong and he became her literary preceptor um, they met only twice okay in person but uh, they wrote uh, um, a lot and they had a very very close relationship actually so after Emily's death Iginson wrote an essay about her about her life about her poetry about her art uh, and uh, he explained how uh, her poems were um, as I said before enigmatic elusive uh, um, kind of ambiguous maybe but also strong powerful revolutionary unconventional tormented of course and somehow quite difficult to understand um, he claimed she she was a rebellious and stubborn woman and um, she answered uh, when, when he, he, he had told her about that she answered that she had to she had to be that way rebellious and and stubborn and and uh, unconventional and whatever because she felt in danger obviously her danger was a sort of a personal psychological uh, metaphysical danger okay and uh, she felt uh, 
in prison she felt pushed she felt pressured and uh, and she had to fight for her own freedom okay for her we can say her we can say her emotional freedom hmm? freedom in spirit and uh, she also said that uh, she was free because uh, there were no judges okay there to judge her and so she could be independent but her attempt at uh, putting herself uh, together uh, tended to explode and uh, it left her destroyed every single time so that could be um, a quite effective metaphor of how she felt of how tormented she was and how she actually uh, she was actually fighting every single day okay to survive i mean um writing wasn't just a literary exercise for her but it was kind of a coping uh, instrument of survival okay she was trying to survive and to uh, go through a life where uh, not only imagination but perception and sensitivity and uh, the perception of universal forces and feelings could be overwhelming. As I said before, many critics tried to understand more about her, why she, self, she was self-isolated and uh, um, they tried also with uh, psychoanalytic interpretations well, for sure we know that her decision to um, live in this lonely condition wasn't uh, uh, caused by a broken heart or disillusionment as far as love, love or affairs were concerned, for sure. We also know that it wasn't due to physical pain or disabilities of any sorts. Uh, we also know that uh, it wasn't because of her lesbian tendencies because someone told or said so in the past uh, because there was the assumption of a possible love between a uh, relationship a romantic relationship between her emily and her sister-in-law sue and between emily and uh, uh, kate scott but actually it made no sense. There wasn't the real, the ultimate reason. Uh, honestly, it doesn't really matter um, why she did that, whether uh, she um, actually knew uh, passion or physical passion or not, uh, whether she suffered uh, disillusionment or not, uh, or she had difficulties in communication or not. Um, I mean, what is important uh, for us is that uh, starting from her feelings, she could create her poetry and every single moment of anguish or torment or personal experience in general was turned into art and uh, a very, very high example of poetry, universal poetry that could actually mirror every single human being in history. Um, he, gives an, his, he actually said that um, every single event in her life um, became dramatic, was turned into a drama. And uh, she adored uh, a man, for example, for the image she had in her mind much more than for the person he was, okay? the real person he was. So there was the idea of abstraction um, and uh, mm, well uh, actually there was a sort of um, you can say an idealistic and metaphysical perception of life that was what actually drove her and her poetry and there was another level uh, it was different from real life we can say that the two um, paths okay never met not completely anyway 
and uh, we are so interested in that universal interpretation much more than, 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 than try and explain her life and judge her life and, and, and try to gossip or well it's, 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 not, it's not important not anymore it never was actually Anyway, um, Higginson also said that she decided to self-isolate because of her personality or habit or, or she, she, she even uh, um, spent years without leaving her home or her garden um, and uh, someone wondered, critiques of course, um, whether uh, it was just a matter of being discreet or proud they talk ab about uh, the uh, we can say the middle class pride because at the time maybe um, people belonging to the upper middle class could find only a few people interesting um, maybe at school and they could uh, still write letters but uh, probably uh, they didn't consider other people or many people interesting and so that was the reason why they decided to live in an isolated way actually uh, it doesn't uh, fit okay um, it's not it's, it's not I mean, there is so much more to, to this and uh, it doesn't really fit and uh, that wasn't uh, absolutely what we, it isn't what we read, okay, behind the lines while reading Emily's letters or poems, etc. Um, she had no desire to travel, for sure, and uh, even not to read that much she read she used to read uh, the bible night and day and uh, she was uh, often I, I i can't say always someone someone says always but we don't, don't know that actually uh, she was often uh, dressed in, in 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 white like a bride okay and she spent her time lying on her bed in a in contemplation and a pensive mood or she was sitting at her desk writing poetry actually only seven poems were published while she was in life um, and and without her name anyway um, but uh, she was very prolific she wrote more than 700 uh, 700 sorry uh, poems in Two years in only two years and the whole collection um, is a collection of 1775 poems so they are a lot and most of them were found by her sister after Emily's death and they talk about as I said before about love about death about uh, uh, hate about loneliness uh, specifically about loneliness there is a very interesting poem I'm going to read it for sure in my next video because it's very 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 meaningful um, and it starts with this line which is it might be lonelier without the loneliness it was written in 1863 and uh, it's 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 very interesting. We were we're going to analyze the old the old poem in my, my next video. But um, this verse alone is very interesting, especially nowadays. Today we are living in a in a, in a period in a, in a moment when well, we talk a lot about loneliness, isolation, the lack of. Uh, relationships or uh, opportunities to have a proper contact and um, we say that it's not natural okay for the human being uh, it generates sort of a um, well a uh, sort of a change in our own personality and uh, well not for the best most of the times uh, but um, there is also um, uh, we can say that there is also an uh, um, instinctive um, way to actually adapt okay and overcome and uh, um, change loneliness into a true companion 
So finding a companionship in loneliness itself, which is personalized somehow. And that's a very interesting perspective. We're going to analyze that in details in my next video. One more thing, and then I'm going to tell you what Emily thought uh, about poetry. Then it's over for today. Uh, one more thing is that uh, her settings were um, most of the times uh, um, um, were what well, we can say were chosen uh, and and represented uh, uh, New England, and uh, and um, they were familiar and very um, we can say it was something close to her. But uh, the interpretation of the settings was quite symbolic, quite metaphysical. Um, we can say uh, from a Puritan perspective, somehow. And as I said before, the hoods, the birds and bees and clovers and, and flowers, they um, had, um, they were details, but they meant much more than themselves, okay? They had a universal meanings. So most of the flowers, I mean, she hadn't uh, even ever seen them, okay? Uh, she probably just saw them on illustrations and books or something. So, um, what was important was the meaning, okay? She wanted to, 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 to convey somehow the tropes. And that's why her, her, her poetry is universal, absolute and eternal. In fact, the idea of uh, the intuition of, 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 of um, infinity is uh, very strong in uh, one of her poems. This I'm going to read you now. It's, 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 it's too important to skip it. She says, forever is composed of nows. It is not a different time except for infiniteness and latitude of all. From this, experienced here, remove the dates, to these let months dissolve in further months and years, exhale in years. Without debate or pause or celebrated days, as infinite our ears will be from Anna Dominus. Now, uh, that's very interesting. So her uh, perception of uh, uh, a never-ending, a sort of a continuum, to use a, 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 in order to use a Latin word, so something that never ends, and uh, that's an idea of time, okay, of uh, uh, infiniteness, as she says, where forever, okay, is made of moments, and these moments are not just moments, but they are the moments we are living right now of nows, she says. That's very important. And um, every single moment, okay, is particular, but all of them together create a whole period of time that has no pauses or, 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 or uh, there are no dates or no, I mean, the, this period of time is kind of uh, just uh, time flowing. Okay, it's like a river, and moments become become days, and days become months, and months become uh, years. Okay, and it's like time. Time is almost breathing. Okay, and that breath is infiniteness. Okay, that's that's very interesting because in the details and in the moments she is living even in a confined world and uh, in a very specific moment she can perceive and she can <clears throat> think about a more universal topic okay where time knows no time actually that is her poetry and why her poetry is um, universal is forever um, <clears throat> alive but what is poetry and that's my, my last uh, um, my last thought for today it's not my thought it, it is her thought of course she wrote uh, to Higginson and I read these last words for today um, she wrote about poetry 
and how she um, recognized poetry. And she said, if I read a book and it makes my body so cold no fire can warm me, I know that is poetry. If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. These are the only way I know it. Is there any other way? And there is no question mark. There is no other way. Okay, this is a question, but it's not a question actually, because she's saying that that is the way. She wrote that in 1865, and, and, and she was very, she was, it was crystal clear that her perception of poetry was physical, was instinctual, okay? It wasn't uh, um, filtered by techniques and, uh, I don't know, conventions, literary conventions or whatever. Uh, it was physical, it was instinctual, it was direct. And that is how her poetry is. And this is how it can give, it can give us chills or physical reactions, because that was the way she recognized poetry. And we're going to read her poems, a, a few, okay, five, I've picked five, five of them, uh, in my next video. I hope you will be here with me, we'll read them together, we'll talk about them together, and uh, if you want to read or to talk about more, please let me know, okay? Um, I can't have enough of, of Emily Dickinson and her poetry, so I am so glad to share with you. I, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please leave me a like or a comment, let me know, okay? Your feedback is so, so, so important to me. Thank you so very much for being here, for following me, for supporting me, and uh, see you very soon again with the American Literature. Bye!